Uh, I swear to God, Dan, the voice, it was... It doesn't it, exist. It kept popping up over and over again. Okay. Look, Terry can you hear You need it. to stop coming to the you sessions. you hear the voice with, again? Uh, okay. I heard the voice from upstairs. It, it, are you guys, like, collectively deluded? Like, I, know what her, is, I know her name, but I'm not telling you What is her name? name? I'm not telling you her name. I don't think she's from... She's from a strange place where they say they're O's like A's. But we can cover that lit. Like I'm very confused right now. <laughs> we can cover. You the, guys keep saying you're hearing a voice. There's and more there's, information there's, on that on the itsamimic.com there is, website. Uh, there is no <laughs> voice. Okay. Anyway, today, team, you guys yeah. ready? Yeah, I guess so. I want to talk about exploration. This is my episode where I'm going to be the DM. Exploration, otherwise known as the forgotten pillar. Some people like to look at their numbers all day and move their little minis around and do the combat. Other people like to do their silly voice for their character. But quite often, we lose exploration. Setting the scene. Where are we? What is the environment? So, and hold on. Should we cut to the opening music? We can cut to the opening music right now. Welcome to It's a Mimic with your DMs, Adam, Dan, and Terry. I swear guys, to God, did you just not I heard it. hear that? Oh, I heard I'm it freaking again. out, heard it Dan. Again. What is like wrong it. with Why you? Why did you guys just stop talking or moving for 30 seconds? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, team. We're so, just moving on? Okay, we're just moving we're on. Just gonna you move guys are crazy. Cool. cool. Yeah. Because yeah, you fine. sound like a strange person when you. When yeah, you I'm, I'm the strange it. person not hearing the voices in my head. That's what we're saying. Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, team. Episode 4 Exploration. The Forgotten Pillar. Um, So, something... I like to get very heavily involved in roleplay. I'm not as interested in numbers and moving minis around and and tactics and stuff like that. But but to coincide with the roleplay, I also like to set a good scene. I like to make uh, the players feel like they're immersed in the scene and what's happening. So, when it comes to setting a scene, should we roll initiative so we can explore our own tactics on this? Sure. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I'm, you rolled really well, but I rolled so much I'm better. going last with a 15. Okay, sure. Uh, that's pretty good. I, I like rolled the 16, and I'm like, sweet, I'm actually going to get to go first this time. Adam's Adam's loading his die, I swear, all the it's time. It's a dance dice. Adam just... pulls out his tome on the top. Remember that time I got him dice as a gift, and they just rolled great for him? Yep, that's the worst when that happens. Yeah. Life is good. Okay, so you want to talk about why exploration is important, right? Yep. And the big thing that I want to talk about is... Pacing. Mm-hmm. I know that we that we'll probably touch on the idea of the different environments and 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 mystery and 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 the different variety, but I really want to focus on pacing for a moment here, because it is so important to not just go from combat to combat to combat to combat to town time, to combat to combat to combat. To combat. Yeah, and I'm very guilty of this myself is skipping the exploration part of it. Because it's really easy when you have the module in front of you, and you and you just read right out of it. You enter the dark, dreary room. Cobwebs hang from the ceiling, and the chandelier swings as if by some invisible force. Right, like you you can get that when it's there for you. Yeah. But I already have pictured in my head what this forest looks like, and I don't describe it to you. I'm just like, hey, all right, so you guys enter the forest. Uh, what's your marching order? Right, and I don't describe it. So. I want to talk about for a moment, like, this is my big fault, pacing. Because your rangers and your rogues and your bards, they're there. They have picked stuff up for the exploration. Yeah. That's why people have chosen these these classes. And so you can go from combat to exploration, and if you don't hammer home the concept of exploration, you're not you're missing so much. First of all, traps. How often do you guys run into traps in my campaigns? Rarely ever. Because I never think to put them in there, or if I do, I forget to give you the trigger or the detail about it because I have zipped right over it. I didn't bother to explain that, oh, this gem over in this on the chalice is this color and it lines up with the eyes in the painting. Of, yeah. like, and I don't do any of that. And so that's my big fault. But it's so important for pacing because it breaks it up. So you're not always focused on the fighting. You're not always focused on, on the role play, and you can let the other people shine for a little bit. And the other thing about it is you get to keep them interested. They never know when the next thing is going to happen. Yeah. Because if they stop to study this mural that you've described in detail, maybe that's this important piece of lore that they need that you expect them to know because you didn't stop to describe it properly. Yeah. 
Um, they don't know it. And so when you hearken back to it later, it's not there anymore, right? And they're, they're confused about it. And so you're trying to explain to them all of this, and now you've taken them out of the game. You've gone almost meta with it, and they're like, okay, so here's the information that I need to know, okay? It's like when I give you guys a book to read, and we do it in midweek content, yeah. it's so that we don't waste time with me describing the pages of a book in a session, right? Because I know that only one or two people are interested in it, Everybody else can can move on to the next fun thing, but it's. I find that with laying out your campaign, not every encounter needs to be combat. Not every encounter needs to be social. You can have an encounter with a room. Explore the room, see what's. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right, and not every room needs to have something big and important in it either. But it can be cool little flavor, little bits and pieces of items that you find or lore that you find. Or even just the idea of this foreboding sense of doom. Yeah. Right? Like, Well, what... that, that's... And from there, you could bled it... You bleed into this, you know, the sense of mystery that comes with exploration as well. Like, um, those of us who played a lot of video games growing up uh, remember S StarCraft and the Fog of War. Yeah. There's going to be a spot where your players will have a range to their vision, a range to what they're picking up to explore through. So, yeah, there's a lot of variety of what you're throwing at them in their environments do that please do that but remember they have a range and play with it right you should be playing with things like lighting um it i find it's one of the most glossed over things when it comes to um exploration because you'll have the half work and you'll have the gnome they've got dark vision good and you have the human who doesn't and but, everybody forgets. But and everyone the forgets. Room, and then you're right? just having a combat, which, by the way, they can't see in. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right? And it's only convenient when the human fighter drops a darkness wand or, or something. I don't know why a fighter would be doing that, but still. Like, <laughs> drops darkness in a spot. Then, at that point, you start caring about visions. And it's but, like, no, no, no. But you got to play with it more than that, too, right? And this is, this is where, again, I fail at this. If I have a giant um, tapestry... Right, and it actually has it is the map of the dungeon you are in, but it is all different colors, and everyone here as is using their dark vision, which is in grayscale, they may walk right by it. Mm -hmm. You gave them that tool, but nobody thought to light a torch or a lantern. Yeah, they're gonna you, miss it. You could also have creatures who are born in the dark, are raised in the dark, who will hide and mess with the players outside I was born of that. Born in the dark. <laughs> Yes. No. By it. <laughs> We've lost the women. Uh, <laughs> or gain some, because it's Tom Hardy. Every, oh. I think every human female I've ever spoken to has hated men doing Bane impressions around them. Yeah. You, sh you should meet my wife. She's fantastic. Anyways, um, the what I was saying is these creatures know the limitation of the surface dweller's eyes and senses and will hide just beyond and use the environment... To mess up and poke fun at those adventures. Before we go into that, though, I want to go back to pacing. Yeah. And I want to ask this question to all the DMs out there that are guilty of this. What the is the rush? What are we trying to get to? <laughs> what are you rushing? Is the game going to end? Is it over? If you're rushing me through going, okay, you've entered the dungeon. Okay, uh, which room are you going in? Is, how is this uh, dungeon different to the last dungeon? How is this temple different to that pyramid? Exactly, how is yeah. this cave network different to that sewer yeah. system? Because now it all sounds like it's the same. I imagine it flat walls and it's great. Uh, it's because... it's like you're playing Doom from the or or the old Wolfenstein game where it's just like flat walls. Exactly. But I know DMs out there will struggle with okay, well, how do I describe something? I've written pages and pages and pages of notes, and it's difficult to do in the moment. And I know I've talked about this on social media, but not everyone has senses... heard of it. The five senses is great, but it's, use that, but get out of it. Okay. I like to think of it more like um, if anyone's ever been. Hypnotized, I'm very confused right now. If anyone's ever been hypnotized. Where the, the whole thing is, is lie down or any kind of therapy or whatever. I'm not asking you guys out there to divulge that. But it's it's lie down, close your eyes, where are you? Tell me where you are, what does it look like, what do you see? And talk about it as though you're there. You as the DM. You have arrived in this building. Tell me what it looks like. Tell me what it smells like. Tell me if you can hear anything. Yeah, what yeah. do the walls feel like? But I know people get caught on the published adventures where they're like, okay, well, I'm reading this, but I can't say it. In time to my players. 
No, take the information, this is my advice, take the information from the published adventure, what does that text box tell you about everything I've just said, so you understand it, now get rid of it and say it as you would say it. So l let, me, let me add that just a little more to it. Sure. One of the best times to do that is when they are entering the next room and you've got your map ready and you're either going to draw it out or you pull out your dungeon tiles or you, whatever it is that you're going to do, before you enter that room... When they open that door, before you lay it down for them, describe it. Yeah. And then when you lay it down, they will understand what they're seeing. Yeah. If I... you draw it first, then you have already spent time in this room in your own mind once. Yeah. And you're just going to rush through it the second time. And if you have certain kind of players who will move their miniatures as soon as there's a room, they're like, oh, what's that inter interesting thing you just drew? And they're across the room before you've had a chance to describe mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. The, my, my tip there, get rid of the map. As soon as that combat's over, you lay that last hit, mini's gone, map off, now listen to me, this is what's happening now. Otherwise, you'll, you'll finish the combat and you may, you may say, the last orc is crawling across the room and he's gasping for breath and he's trying to whisper something. And the player will go, I will move over there. Pick their mini up and move it over. And yeah. everyone's now looking, we're playing chess again. As yeah. soon as that combat's over, mini's gone, map gone, and the, you're describing. The other thing too is that the moment that you have a map and... Look, I love my maps. I really I love do. them too. But the moment I put They're a map right. down <laughs> and Dan sees that there's a bookcase, he's ignored everything else in the room. Right. Right. There's no exploration at this point because I've shown him, look at this bookcase. Right. And that's what he has. Instead of me. Like cake to a fat kid. Yeah. <laughs> or, or a bookcase to a fat kid. <laughs> <laughs> we do enjoy our words. <laughs> so. So, but <laughs> you killed me. <laughs> <I'm broken. laughs> but but the point remains is that you if you draw it out, they are already moving. Yeah. Right. So if you stop everything to focus on this, then and your players may not like it at first. A lot of them are going to sit there and look at the watch and go, "Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on." When do I get to swing my sword? But. Some people will. And this is where you're going to get people to start thinking about things like scrying and rituals and things outside of combat for them to use to explore beyond I, I start checking for hidden traps. I, I start poking the walls to see if there's a trigger for a hidden door. Mm -hmm. Right? When we get to move beyond, anytime that there's a portrait hanging up, every player wanders over and looks behind the portrait. Mm -hmm. But if you don't draw the portrait on your map, because who has time for every little detail in a room? If you don't draw it on the map, they're never going to go over there and look behind it. So they're relying on you to describe it, but they're already looking at the map and planning the next three turns. Yeah. And so this is why I say pacing is so key with this. Slow everything down and let people explore the world. We talk about this collaborative storytelling. Tell the story. And, th and that's the thing I like about... Uh, I both like and hate about using the miniature style of the map and, and, and everything else is because unless... I, I actually did a test, and Adam, you were part of the group that I, I did this, and I don't think I talked to you about it yet. So, hey, podcast content. Um, I have been prone... I Years ago, I bought those inch-by-inch inch grade vinyl mats that you could put yep. on your oh, yeah, table I mean, and yeah. draw on with wet erase markers. I have one, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one behind us here. So, like... Um, it, yeah, it's back there. Uh <laughs> I have for years just taken some markers and described the room as I'm drawing it out on the table. And I'll be like, I'll draw that little, yeah, you're in a 15 by 15 foot room and there's a chair here and a desk here and a table over here and a ritual circle over here. And for years, that's the way I've played. But since joining your campaign and you have those pre-made maps that you cut out and then you describe the room and then go whoop bam, and drop it on the table or you watch things like critical role or these other games where matt mercer goes into detail describing these areas and the the critters go ahead and they mess around and, and explore it and then once there's finally combat he's like one second let me go grab this 3d printed yeah. glorious battle thing and drop it down and then everyone's looking at what he has described in their head being placed in front of them. So you played right? it both sides. That's so you played it both to sides, yeah. That's, yeah, that's absolutely what so, you need sorry, to So you started to say, what did you do? So I have found that players are far more engaged if you describe first, then reveal map, rather than reveal map and then describe what's in the room. Yeah. Even absolutely. if you are using the inch-by-inch inch grid, describe first, 
and then scribble it down. So, uh, so a lot of DMs that there are writers, and a lot of writers hear the phrase "show don't tell." It's the exact opposite with maps and exploration. Oh yeah, exact totally opposite. Don't so show. Don't right. get that map out. Do not even get that map out until we rolled initiative. Until we are that close to what's I, happening. I, I wouldn't even so say that. I wouldn't even say. I'm done on pacing. If you I, I, I wouldn't even say. I'm going to continue. I wouldn't even say. Uh, you interrupted me. Uh, I wouldn't even say wait until you've rolled initiative because this could be a social encounter. This could be right. This yeah. could be Great a. Point. This could be a uh, encounter that is solved. Purely theater of the mind. Mm-hmm. And if you could accomplish pulling an encounter, keeping your entire table engaged while doing a social encounter theater of the mind, and then the social encounter is done, that NPC who was going to be a fight is now somehow disarmed and dismantled, put aside, throw down the map as a treat. You're completely or right. Or at the end of the session, be like, you guys were supposed to fight in that room, here's what it looks like. You're completely right, right on that because as soon as you put the map out, you're saying, we're fighting. Exactly. This is what is yeah. happening now. Yeah, that okay. act is, this is a fight, draw your weapons. And that was also the point that I was getting to when I said as soon as, if there is a fight, get rid of that map instantly. Because if you ever try to have a social encounter when there's minis on the table, it is a nightmare. Yeah. Nobody's paying attention. Everyone's looking at their mini and going, we're going to move it over here. I'm going to move my guy over here. And that, that's the other thing about about uh, the maps is you lose the air of mystery. Yeah. yeah. And we've said, well, I think we've used the phrase air of mystery like four times already. But it's so important for the exploration factor, right? And so you're for out- there to be the known, and for there to be discovery in the game, there needs to be the unknown, right? But even with the social encounter, exactly what you're saying, the moment that you put this down, there is a touchstone for them to to interact with that is not engaging their imagination at all, right? So they're not engaged in this conversation that's happening. They're busy going, "I wonder what that red dot on the map is." Yeah, right. And so you you've taken it away. And I know that this is really supposed to be about exploration, but I mean, to a degree, social encounters can be exploring the content. Maybe you're talking to someone who has been trapped in this area, and they're mm-hmm. going to give you hints and, and whatnot. I mean, they all blend together to some degree, but it's it's so important to set the scene first, I guess, is, mm-hmm. is the yeah. point. And just touching on what you said there about mystery is is to think of the old sort of Hitchcock technique, which is, it's what you can't see yeah. as well. So what we get, um, I know all of us now, we, we get a lot of questions and things like that. And somebody reached out to me today, actually, uh, and sent me some very well-written paragraphs about a campaign that they were going to run. It was just asking my advice, and I said, it's very well-written, but all you're talking about is what the players can see. That's all you're talking about. If you're in, in a, a dungeon network or a cave network or something like that, take that out, what they can see. Just talk about what they can hear, what they can smell. What can they hear coming from the next room? Because that is more terrifying than what they can see in this room right now. Can I can I ask you guys? I mean, it's a bit of a trick question, but how many senses we have? Well, people would argue that things like balance and temperature control. That's are senses that's well. kind of where I'm going with this. Is don't just focus on your sight, smell, and hearing. Those are the big ones, yeah. right? Suddenly the air becomes dry. Yeah. Right. Suddenly it becomes warm, or you get this this feeling of someone is watching you. Right, these are feelings. These are other things you can do. You're one of the things that you can do is say your heart starts to hammer in mm-hmm. your chest. You start to feel cold. Yeah, yeah. The, right. The the sweat on your brow suddenly feels a breeze across it. And you feel but, fingers drag across the back. Of but 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 even, but even then, that's feeling. What about the things like uh, you can tell just by walking that you are now moving uphill, just from the direction of the yeah. ground. Right. Mm-hmm. There are so many more things besides just the the regular five senses. And I mean, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to make a character that can only taste in the future. So, <laughs> but that what you're saying just there, licking dungeon what walls. You're saying ah, a great ooze. We're done. So <laughs> where are dungeons? Typically, dungeons are underground. Yes, you could argue something like Castle Ravenloft is a dungeon and it isn't the way it's set up. Yeah. But dungeons are typically. When was the last time that anybody told you that you were getting deeper underground? We just dungeons. Oh, all the are, time. Are just the flat. Right? You go from this room to this room to this room. Until you hit a stairwell. And then you pass by it until you're finished that floor. And then you go it's, to the next it's floor. It's the Diablo 2 method yeah. of playing, right? But even that, okay, so that's a stairwell, but then we go down to another flat. But wouldn't a cave network just gradually get yeah. deeper and deeper and it's, deeper? It's not a flat plane. It's got some yeah, gradient to absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, great point. Anything else, guys, on uh, the pacing or mystery or setting the scene at all? Uh, no, no. I'm, I think I'm good. I'm happy. I want to talk about one of my favorite parts of the game, which, Adam is right, is often overlooked, and I wish it wasn't, and between the three of us, we're going to bring it back. Narration and setting the scene. 
Sorry, let me do that again. I want to talk about one of my favorite parts of the game, guys, which is often overlooked, and I wish it wasn't. Narration and descriptive phrases. Should we roll initiative? Let's. Of course you did. Not of course 20. you did. Oh, who got 20? You? That'd be me. Are I'm you surprised? Si this has got to be... This is you are you real. are not allowed to use my dice next time. This can't be real. I am, next I, time I record, you're bringing your own, or you're not rolling. I'm blessing your dice. You should roll these in, in the. It campaign doesn't help now. that we all picked a green die. They're as well. so ugly. I know. These dice are hideous. All Except right. for this one, green has got a charm. So so sorry. Narration and uh, and descriptive phrases. Terry, what do you mean? Yes. So there is the argument that when it comes to narration and um, descriptive phrases, that some classes are built for it. Yeah. Some people may say, fighters are not built for descriptive phrases. I run in, I swing my sword, or stab them with my spear. It's not built for that. But maybe the wizard is, with their spellcasting abilities. The druid is, with how they interact with nature. Do you agree with that? What's your argument? What would you like to include? Uh, mm, mm, mm. Uh, this, you gotta wait your turn. Yeah, that's right. So, I would say that from a DM perspective, every player at the table deserves their chance to describe uh, what they're doing and how they're interacting with the environment. Yeah. However, there are some players that are more geared to it than others. It is your job as a DM to read your players. My favorite time of any session is when you guys are talking amongst yourselves and I can sit back and just listen. Mm -hmm. Because, my God, I am taking mental notes. I'm seeing... not Okay, so you guys have a goblin. You're going to interrogate the goblin and we're going to see what's going on. I'm not looking for who's going to interrogate them and how. I'm looking for who's not getting involved and why. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who's on the edge? Who goes, well, we don't have to go that far, right? Because now I'm getting people's limitations. There are some that are far more eager to do exploration than others. And one of the ways you can tell this is based upon, A, obviously, who's in the door first. B, who's picked up the appropriate tool set to do something. If there are tools of any kind, if there's a kit or a tool that player wants to use it, and I guarantee that we've forgotten it by session three. It gets overlooked too often, but yeah, I Always, agree with you right? on that. Um, so, but when it comes down to rogues that are stealthy, rangers who half of their shit is environmental stuff. Yes, right? yeah. Um, and, and bards for kind of more urban social encounters, but they, they've got every magic user has some ability. Druids... Um, there are so many monks who can walk, walk across water at some point. All of these are environmental bonuses that they're getting, and they chose this character with this path for this reason. Yeah. So lean into those characters. That player who is playing the rogue monk is far more invested in exploring what's going on in the ceiling than your barbarian who has just been drinking at the pub, and that's what he always does <laughs> every single game. Time that you play because barbarians it, are boring and there's no way to make them interesting. That, that's why they call them. Fight. We are going to fight. That's why they call them barbarians. <laughs> oh Whoa. no, they don't. You heard it. Here first. <laughs> um, I I just want to say we're we're yeah. talking a lot of like if this person is playing this class, lean into their the reasons why, and I completely agree, especially if they want to narrate these abilities. Yes. You need to enable the fighter into engaging in the social encounter. You need to enable the wizard into getting in the fisticuff brawl fight. Right. Like, but I'm saying by session twelve, you should know who around the player is in, or who around the table, which player is interested in this. True, but they're in a more mechanically minded uh, group, which there are out there. Lots of groups, you know, want to play optimized characters more than playing. Uh, very fluffy characters. Yeah. Um, and not saying they're one, they're negating each other, but they're not mutually happens. exclusive. But they're sure. not mutually okay. exclusive. But in more mechanically minded parties, I have been a part of so many groups that's like, well, I'm playing the barbarian. I've got my eight charisma. This is a social encounter, so I'm out. And they don't even try. It's like, no, you get that NPC to be like, hey, you, big guy, come here and engage with yeah, that I, person. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to touch on that real quick with what you just said. Because just because that character has decided that they're no use or they're not interested here, does that mean that the NPC is suddenly not interested? Well, exactly. Oh, like, oh, if oh, they oh. have a mechanical negative, there's no reason why that should uh, uh, let, limit someone from doing Let's go right back into the trope of the barbarian, though. And I'm going to prove your point here is sometimes you tank intelligence so you can walk in and be like, no, I eat them. 
right? Because that's a character you want to play, and that's how you want to attack your social encounters, right? right? And so you're still just as involved, but I'm talking specifically exploration. Yes. Okay. Right, so... Yeah, we are dipping into roleplay there. So, so just to, to focus on... Well, even... Well, and I wanted to bring it out for... Well, sorry, I'm interrupting you a bunch. Go ahead. So, no, look, what, I want to hear what you have to say. So... It's your turn. Even when it comes to a bunch of exploration um, issues, like uh, seeing in the dark, uh, actually going through and searching a bookcase, there's no reason why the big dumb barbarian can't be like, oh, look, there are books here. Right, but when they are sitting there and it's the 12th session in a row, where it's like, okay, so you're in this room now, the bad guys have been killed, there are all these books, and the player that's a barbarian goes, I understand by the door and see if anyone else comes by. You're not explaining to that person anymore, no. right? You are now talking to the wizard at the bookshelf or the rogue picking the lock on the desk, right? So know your audience so that you can stay clear and brief when you need to. Yeah. Or you can get very descriptive if you have everyone's attention. Or maybe there's one player that's super quiet at your table that never gets the opportunity to do much in combat. And this is where they shine. Yeah, fair enough. So, yeah. so my point is read the table and know which of your character classes are chosen for uh, interaction with the environment and exploration. Also people types for this. So when you just said read the table there, because I just want to touch on description a little bit more. There are some people, and we even know at the tables that that we've played in, where, okay, you're casting a spell. Sure, okay, describe your spell to me. And they talk about their hand movements. I like to talk about slapping the back guano and their coal together, whatever, and spitting it through. And uh, But other people won't. And it may not be that they're not interested in that. Remember, some people are more nervous. They're new to the game. Absolutely. And D&D, I don't care what you think, is intimidating because it is played by nerds, and nerds have opinions, and nerds are mean. Okay? So you come to a we table... We are not, you little piece of... You come to a table... <laughs> you piece of bat guano. You come to a table, for example, like I just did, and I just said, yeah, but barbarians suck. And if you've been super keen... See, I'm putting it on myself now. If you've been super keen to play this barbarian, you are going to shrink. So I think as the DM, learn to read your table. The players that want to describe their spells, absolutely go for it. But what about that barbarian that just came that they don't... Okay, what do you do? I just I want to hit that guy. Is, is that right? I might lead by describing that for them. And then build up into us doing it together. Yeah, and, and this is so, part of what I was saying. Stop. The, and then build up to us doing it together. So I might go, okay, so what you're telling me is you want to swing with your sword and cut across where you want to hit them. They might say across their chest, okay? So they get to, to, to building them up to the point where they can describe it themselves. The other thing that I like to do right in that same vein is I'll say, I, you guys know, when you get the killing blow, how do you want to do it? Right, exactly. Right, yeah. And every time someone gets a killing blow... You guys know that Adam's going to say, how do you want to do it? Right? And that's usually the signifier that this guy is now dead. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, I hit him. I do 93 damage. How do you want to do it? And the table goes, oh, thank God. Right? Because, <laughs> because that, that's my <laughs> phrase for that. But there are also times as well, and you get this a lot with theater of the mind, where um, when someone does something, whether it's exploration, they're over there and they're digging through the cubby and they find a little gem over here and then someone else at the bookshelf... And the barbarian is at the door not paying attention. And you come back to their turn or you say, hey, you know what? That player's been sitting there quietly for five minutes. And you say, hey, look. And you describe again for them what just happened. There's no harm in repeating from a narrative standpoint what the other players just did to help this player understand what's happening around them. Yeah. And so we talked about that a little bit um, with the theater of the mind and the combat, but it's also really important with the exploration. And this is where we get into what you were talking about, Dan, with the uh, be aware of their sight is, okay, so the rogue, the gnomish rogue who can see in the dark, takes off. And he goes down there and he sees this and this and this and this, and now it's the fighter. And the fighter, the player's been listening, going, oh, I can't wait to do that. But he's a human and he can't see it. He's like, I can't wait to interact. So you come to their turn and you say, all right, so... You saw the gnome disappear into the darkness. You hear the following things echoing back at you, right? And you you repaint it for them, so now that they have to explore, right? Right. And so, um, I don't I don't know. If that's I think that I think th- that's all three of us there. Unless anyone else has something they want to add on to narration and descriptive phrases there. Um, just I, just because they're quiet doesn't mean they don't have an imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And sometimes, and here's the other thing, and I know it's going to fly in the face of everything we just we just said. But sometimes leave things up to their imagination, right? Mm. Um, you don't have to describe down to every single detail what this NPC looks like. 
Yeah. You can just say they have a big nose and a mole on their cheek, and everyone will picture something a little bit differently, and that's enough. Yeah. So clarity and brevity are actually really key sometimes. You need just enough to engage them, yeah. but make sure that you're engaging them in the appropriate yeah. ways. Yeah, what you need to do is you need to be able to empower your parties, your players' imaginations. Like, right. this is a game where, uh, and around this table, we are going to really rally for a lot of theater of the mind and using it and embracing it. Um, Speak for yourself. Uh, <laughs> you don't spend hours at a time putting together those beautiful maps for theater of the mind. <laughs> I, I, I sit there for like at eleven o'clock the night before we play, scribbling madly with pencil crayons, and suddenly going, "Okay, okay, okay. I hope they never use this map. I just hate this map." <laughs> I, I it, there's not a doubt in my mind that you actually do precisely that. So, anyways, then, before so, you were rudely interrupted, the imagination of. Your players, your imagination is an incredibly powerful tool that everyone at the table has and is the reason we're around this table is to hang out and engage in using our imaginations to stop, uh, to We want to hang out with, that, with our tools. Yeah. 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 We want to hang out with the tools out. Yeah. We want to <laughs> rock out Why with our uh, rock gnomes. Yeah. Rock gnomes. <laughs> out. Thank you, Terry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's the, your imagination is an incredibly vivid and powerful thing and even if you're quiet if you're the guy who wants to run the table at all times with your monk character whatever it is you are engaging your imagination and the more you describe whether it be brief or or um prolonged even you are just engaging your imagination and and there's nothing wrong with that no and i know that what we said earlier is people are slow to get into it Sometimes they don't know if they should. Yeah. They feel vulnerable, especially around the mean, angry nerds with their opinions. But you, as the DM, should be helping bring that out of yeah. them. Yeah, and if them you feel en- safe, and if you engage that person's imagination, it could break them out of that shell to be able to describe back to you. And even if there's a miscommunication or two, is like, no, I wanted to lop off his head, not his leg. Whatever, roll with the punches. So now, right? do what your players err on the side of your player's imagination over your own is what I would say. Sure. sure. So now we've the, that we start to move into, you were just talking about engaging your players. Let's talk about how we can make the game more engaging. Can, can we do a shout out first? Ooh, it's shout out time. We couldn't go much further without acknowledging the All Natural Twenties, a group of nerdy women who make the online community much more fun as they terrorize the D&D landscape with their wit and memes. They just wrapped up their campaign against Strahd and Barovia last week, so who knows where these lovely ladies might go next. You can follow them on Instagram at All Natural Twenties, and make sure to check out their bio to get a hold of their Twitch stream too. Whatever you do, though, don't take your eyes off Pepperina. She's a feisty one. Okay, we're moving into making the exploration more engaging. So we'll, we'll go through various points, but I want to talk about where you guys draw your inspiration from, some of the best explorations uh, that you've ever seen. But before that, as always, we must roll initiative to see who gets to go first before the other two interrupt them. Yeah, before Dan talks, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I haven't done very much talking at all. I'm so so this I, is, I have I've just ruled this entire episode. How many times do you get to say shit on this podcast? Because this is bullshit. <laughs> it's freaking bullshit. This is like time number five. At least twice, yeah. <laughs> um, it's our favorite word, apparently. Okay, so uh, you want to talk about uh, exploration? E- uh, making the exploration more engaging for your players. And, and also, what, whatever you want to talk about with regards to where you draw your inspiration from to do this. Okay, one of the things that I want to get into is uh, is using the abilities uh, yes. appropriately. Um, and these are like skill challenges. Uh, they introduced these, was it in 4th Ed that they yeah. did skill challenges? Where I, they codified them, yes. Yeah, I absolutely love them. Where you say, hey, you know what, there are these five or six things, or it's, sorry, it's usually an odd number, like five or seven or whatever, things you need a certain amount of successes versus a certain amount of failures. If you can, as a group, get a certain number of successes with these skill challenges, for example, you're running down a hallway and there's something to jump over, there's something to crawl under, there's a, a fork in the road, you have to determine which way to go, so it's a survival check. If there are all of these different skill challenges, this just made this exploration more interesting. Do you tell them what they need to achieve, or do you keep that to yourself? I tell them, uh, oh, as far as the number on the die? Like, you just said, you need to pass this so many times. Would you tell them that, or would you... Oh, no. Uh, well, no. Uh, I would not tell them unless it is life or death. 
when you are running out of the volcano that is exploding, I will be up front because if you fail, you all die. Right. And you don't want to be like, oh, you rolled a, a seven? I'm sorry, everyone's dead. Is that Next a, campaign. Is that a time to read the table as well? With some tables, you'd be able to not have to tell them that? Uh, yes. Again, I think yeah, it depends theory. on the subject. Yeah, yeah. it depends, it depends on, on the, the scenario. Yeah. It depends on the people around the table as well. I've played with some people that would absolutely hate that method. If they die on a skill challenge, they would lose their mind. Yeah. If I if they die in a social encounter, they would lose their mind. So Dan would just be pulling out his next binder with character going, No <laughs> Next binder, it's a digital age, my friend. I just flip to the next page on my oh, phone. I can't, that's gonna be another podcast, but I'm I'm not there yet. I can't no, do, I can't do no, digital dungeons and dragons. God, I just vomit. No, okay, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Once again, Dan is wrong. Peasants. So, <laughs> peasants. So as far as as far as inspiration goes, um, for me. I'm pulling it from every movie, and I have seen many movies. One uh, or two. Um, I, I, I'm pulling from movies, and I'm trying to get the ideas, but it's not just your Indiana Jones about, hey, you know what, there's a boulder when you pull the thing off of this, and this crazy thing happens. I'm looking at, uh, at when I looked at Raiders of the Lost Ark, I went, hey, cool, jungles and rivers. Mm-hmm. And I pulled my environment from it, not necessarily my, my combat encounter, and every single combat that I do is based on the environment. Yeah. So I always start at the exploration level first. And I say, where are we? Then I say, who's there besides the party? And then I say, where's the combat? Right? Is there an actual fight to be had here? Or do we stay social? Mm-hmm. Right? And, and if where are you is enough of a challenge where you're rolling dice, then this is an exploration part. If then there's someone there, that can be a social encounter. And if that goes poorly, and it can go poorly right off the bat when that person is a wolf. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. But there's that social counter of it smells you, and now it's attacking, right? Like, yeah. there is that moment of an interaction, right? Now, no matter how brief it is. And then I move on to the combat aspect. So um, I would say that skill challenges are one of my favorite things in the world, and I don't use them enough. I, but it would I, be my first place to go. For me, um, we talk about exploration and environment as being like, the, the forgotten pillar, um, it is possibly, and I, I think when it is used well, it, it, it is probably the best part of the game. And skill challenges themselves are a fantastic way to engage the party into them. I, I, I'm with you. I love skill challenges. Um, I find a lot of DMs I've had in the past do the whole, okay, I need everyone to... There, there's a couple ways to handle skill challenges. There's the... Um, I need everyone to roll their uh, stealth checks. And then, depending on the DC, you know whether the party has succeeded or failed that, you know, collective stealth check. Is it always right? collective? Just for a stealth check, just as a side note? What uh, if one person fails? Then that person is loud. Clomp, 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 clomp. Uh, I hate that. I, uh, okay. I did that I'm just, taking to, a quick, just to annoy Dan. I'm taking a the quick aside. Sneezes. Yeah. There is no reason to play a paladin in a party of Dungeons and Dragons at any point in time if you are going to be the guy who's constantly ruining every single stealth check. To get around that, to enable people to be able to play that paladin with that group of rogues and rangers and barbarians who can actually shut their damn mouths and make it down a hallway without alerting every single town guard in the keep. To be able to play that guy, do it as a skill challenge. Because then your party collectively wins it, and it's your rogues and everyone else, you know distracting the guards for enough time for your big heavy male plate guy who destroyed his role to be like, clump, 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 clump. Well, that's Stop. how I used to do it. I used to let, when I had my heavy plate armor, if we were going into a room and it was going to require a stealth check, I went, you guys go first, I'll just hang out here. Yeah, I've got but, a crossbow. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was a fantastic way for me as a DM to split the party. They're still in the same room, but one guy's outside of it, and now I have someone ambushing from the back. Yeah. Right? Like, that is a great technique if you're going to use it that way. Uh, see, I don't like having the whole party have to pass. I like where you have to choose. Oh, no, I'm not but... saying they have to pass. I'm saying they have to average a passing yeah, yeah. rate. Okay, that's my oh, yeah, okay. right? that, that, point. So, like, I'll like set that. the DC at 15, and then if there's six people around the table, you know, the person crits, well, that counts as two. The person botches, that counts as one of those who negate themselves, right? Then you have, you know, three more people left, or four more people left, because I'm great at math. Um... Three of them succeed, one of them fails. That means you have two passes. That means you win. Hmm. That means the party gets this. That's weight- now, now, if it's heavily weighted and it's close, throw in a little bit of extra flavor of this happens. They got, like, 
Someone seemed to get attention, and then it was pulled away, and you guys succeeded well, can, can, by the skin of your teeth. Can I simplify it? I, I have what I think is the better method. Um, just because, to, okay. Just because there's less math involved, and in fifth ed they really lean away from the math. And what you're doing is averaging, and you're pulling this, and you're this is worth one, and that's worth two, and that's a lot. I make it really simple. If you are there with a rogue and a ranger, and you are a paladin or full plate male, and the ranger says, you know what, I'm going to remind him to walk stealthily, and the rogue says, hey, you know what, don't breathe so heavy, and hold your arms up because they clank against your breastplate. <laughs> uh, then, then you have this vision of the paladin tiptoeing with his arms, like raised in the air, going, <laughs> right? And he's going, and it's fantastic. So now when he rolls, not only does he get advantage from the aid, but he also gets a plus two on his roll from the help. And that's why I run with aid and help. And so now it's still up to the paladin to roll it. So he rolls a one, it, or two ones, it doesn't matter. I would, right? I would say, I see what you're saying there, and I see what you're saying. I'm going to say I disagree with both of you. Oh, no. How controversial. <laughs> How controversial. <laughs> we did promise on three different opinions. And I know this is one long aside, but I was curious about this, this particular point. This is the whole point of the game. Some people are good at fighting. Some people have high AC. Some people are good at sneaking. If you are in a particular situation with your exploration where you need to be quiet and you're in heavy plate armor, sucks to be you in that moment. When you get to the last room and you're fighting the dragon going to be good to be you so i see what you're saying with yeah. your average if you have five party members and four of them pass if one of them fails they have failed that person has been revealed what the rest of the party decides to do is but that to person them. will is never fail on the guy that person <laughs> will <laughs> never the rogue is, ever, is going to go <laughs> that person will never ever ever like if you are a dex dump stat fighter wearing your full plate male armor you are not you are rolling uh you're rolling your stealth check at potentially a negative number yep. at disadvantage. Yep. Yes. You yep. are but going you're to really fail good at combat. every you, single yeah, time. But you're yep. really good at combat. But that's the game. So, so you are... <laughs> I'm, I'm back in Terry now. You know what? It's so good that you're good at combat because you will draw combat in every single in but, every single. But that's the moment. character that you chose that's to be. What, what, what's saying you have to be that? Why can't you? No, then pick a different character. Pick a different character. <laughs> they take your armor off. Like, I, I think it is absolutely hilarious to have the paladin go, we will clear this cave and have to stand at the front door while everybody else <laughs> sneaks in and then all of a sudden you think of okay come on and then and they spend the first two rounds running to catch up with everybody and on round three they own that fight but likewise that's already sometimes over the wizards have to pull themselves up cliffs and they have to roll athletics checks it, that's yeah, the, I, I, okay I, I, so I, I did say there were two ways of doing a good skill challenge I'm gonna move on I'm gonna do the second go one ahead, go ahead we're not gonna agree on this because you two are idiots it was a quick the, aside <laughs> I was just like quick side note tw 20 minutes later yeah, yeah. the 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 second way of doing a skill challenge and and this is this is become rapidly becoming one of my favorite ways is let the party decide what skills they're going to use to have that success. Now, this is really good if you have a um, more of a research kind of thing or a tracking or chase scene or something along those lines where you have your party go, well, we're chasing down these bears throughout through the jungle. So I'm going to use my, uh, well, my survival's high. So I'm going to use my survival to track them. Next person. Well, they can't use survival because the previous person did. So they go, okay, well, I want to use... So everybody my... gets to use a different skill. Everyone gets to use a different skill to match a DC. And if the party matches that DC, they pass, they catch up. Do you have Depending to justify how... it? Like, you have to say what, I would what you're doing? I would encourage justification. Uh, I'm not like, using Arcana to track bears. Yeah, so unless you come with a good reason. Unless but... you come up with a good reason. Like, uh, they're I've not actually... just bears. I decided. I, yeah. I, I had a guy go, well, they're dire bears so what i'm going to do is i'm going to draw a quick little rune in the ground that is a bit of a wayfair towards a powerful magic source so he's casting detect magic but he's doing it in a flavorful way that is aiding in the skill challenge yeah go nuts i'm happy with that oh yeah I see right what you're like they're describe it now you're going to have those timid people at the party at the table who don't really do describing all that well they're not available and they go can i just do a perception Yes, you could just do What perception. about the people that don't understand what they could do? So what you described there was probably either a creative player or a more experienced player. What about the people that are brand new at the game and you're going, you choose which skill as long as you can tell me how. And I like, recently had this. I recently had this in one of my games. Uh, one of my games has a brand new player to 
tabletop role playing, let alone Dungeons and Dragons specifically. Um, and we had the encounter. You're chasing the bears through the woods. And he's like, well, what can I do? Athletics? What does that mean? It's like, well, you're playing a human fighter. So what you could do... <laughs> it means everything. It me- athletics means everything to you, right? You you are bounding through the um, jungle trying to outfoot race these uh, bears, right? And he goes through and they'll ask questions. Encourage your players to ask questions. There's no harm in asking a question for clarification on what to use in your skill challenge. When, okay, so I would I would also say that if you want to put a different spin on that, I like what you're saying, but if you don't want to say, like, look, everyone, we're, we're out in the Arctic, and everyone has got to live somehow, like, we don't have winter yep. clothes and stuff, what do you do? you're pretty much stuck on your uh, survival, right? There's a handful of others, but you're not really using your knowledge history to get out of this one, necessarily? I would disagree. Well, hold on, hold on. If you can justify on. it, you could roll it. That's my that's my philosophy. I made a meme about this that you two argued over, so it's hilarious that we're actually talking about this. So, no, but I don't think it makes any sense for for the player that doesn't know a thing about history to go, uh, history? Right? <laughs> so I think that what, what you can do Well, no, but is, you're encouraging your players to finish this. a sentence. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I think that what you can do, if three of the people there have survival... As their proficiencies, you can say only use your proficient abilities. Yeah. Right? And so that allows three people to use survival. And maybe they will do so well that the fourth person doesn't need to or gains advantage. Because the others are building a fire. Their survival is sit close to the fire. Right? Like, <laughs> whatever it is. But if if it's about proficiency yeah, as opposed to just, well, the last guy did it so you can't. That's going to kind of cripple your, your similar classes. Where obviously everybody here has picked acrobatics. And we know that because everyone in the party is a rogue ranger and monk. Whoever rolled highest gets to use it. And everyone else is left going, I will sleight of hand my way out of this boulder falling on me. Right? And and sometimes you can rely, to touch on what you're saying, sometimes you can rely on a player whose job it is to do this thing. Yeah. If you need rations, if you need food, you are going to send the ranger... To go and hunt something. Yeah. You're yeah. not going to be like, okay, everybody roll a survival check, and then your wizard's trying to trap something. And, and that's another thing, too, that drives me nuts, and I just want to touch on this really, really quickly, because I know that we're kind of going long, um, is do you guys allow your players to all roll the same thing? Like, oh, I'm going to try to row the boat. All right, so you roll your athletics. You fail. Okay, well, then I'm going to try to roll the boat. I, too, right. will do an inside check. Yeah, <laughs> right? Like, how, many, how often do you put up with that? Now... There's some things like perception, investigation, and insight, where I think that everybody can inherently do that. Yeah. But uh, like, if your barbarian fails the intimidation and your gnome rogue steps up and goes, "Well, then I'm going to do it." Do you do you let them? It depends on whether or not they know if they failed. Okay, so let's use that social encounter for an example. If you go roll intimidation, clack clack clack, thirteen. They're going. Is it thirteen to pass or not? And you say NPC whatever. Stares at you, narrows his eyes, and goes, "Okay," and then carries on the conversation. They've rolled a thirteen. I don't think they should know whether or not they've passed that. So if someone else says, "I too will roll intimidation," do you've got no justification to know whether or not the other person's passed or failed? The thing that it comes up more often than not, though, is when that one person who is good at it goes, "I will roll to intimidate." Clack clack clack. Well, I botched. I also don't like that though. I don't like it when a player, and it's usually more experienced players, will go, uh, I'm going to try and intimidate him. And because me telling the story is going, I haven't decided whether or not that warrants intimidation for that person. You can't tell me that you're going to try and intimidate an ancient dragon. You can tell me what you want to do. I yell at the dragon. And I will go, okay, roll intimidation to see how that. Or I might go, no, son. That you can, okay, you can yell all day. It's a dragon. You know? yeah. yeah, you can go ahead and try to grapple that thing. I mean, you're essentially grappling to hold on. So <laughs> I, I don't always agree with the, the players telling me what skill they're going to use at that time. Tell me what you're doing, and I will tell you what skill I think it relates to. Yeah. A lot and, of, and you a could lot use of time, all of this at the same time. Yeah. Right? A lot of the time we do that with our knowledges at our table, whether it's arcana or nature or history. Well, sit there and I go, okay, look, the ranger's rolling in nature the uh, because it's a magical beast. Someone else is going to roll arcana, and is there any reason at all it's, that this would come up in your lore? 
uh, in the background of any story that you've read in the past? Maybe. All right, so you roll a history, and and so now we see how that yeah, plays out. Yeah, the wizard so. may roll a history check based on their studies. A cleric is going to roll a religion check based on their religious texts. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes you can use different roles for the same outcome as well, yeah. uh, especially when exploring. The, um, my my only my only thing I would hazard, and, and we are going to go long because this is uh, divisive. Apparently, they don't care. Um, you, we're talking about encourage your players to use their proficient skills. The problem is when players only use their proficient skills, they should be given the opportunity to use the skills they're not proficient in as well. No, I'm talking skill challenges only. Oh no, skill and I'm talking for skill challenges as well. Give them the opportunity to roll. Like, okay, you're a fighter. Well, you have to roll stealth for this one. Or, I agree with or, that. Or, or something like that, and right? I can't like, believe I just said that. I agree with that. Because th- that's the whole point of having different modifiers. Yeah. Is sometimes are, it's not going to go well. You are a full, fleshed out character. Why are you just going to bang these three skills you have over and over and over again and ignore the other ones? Okay, but my argument is because we said that you can't use the same skill as somebody else. Well, hold on, because it's a skill challenge, right? So in this scenario, we said, well, they rolled acrobatics, so you can't. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. You can all roll acrobatics. No, no, no. Like, you said the floor falls out. One person gets to try and grab the side. Yeah. No! One second, oh, I can't do that. There's no more. a history check. Have I seen floors? <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there Did is... Did my god send this? <laughs> I hate you people. Sorry, Dad. Trying to get oh, a point oh. across. No, like, it, there's different kinds of skill challenges. You would, of course, use different kinds of skills in said skill challenges, depending on what the what you want to accomplish. Skill challenges are varied and very important part of this game now, I would say. Very integral to use because they really engage your players into exploring environments and everything else around them. Now, whether you do it in such a way where you encourage, not force per se, but encourage characters to use skills that they're proficient in or encourage them to use skills they're not and then justify why and it really brings people into their character and be like why does oscar the half-orc barbarian you know have this arcane knowledge he shouldn't but know what you can roll it if you want see i don't like that i don't like that because now you're retconning this guy's history because no, you rolled well in a, on a D20. He was in a bar drinking one night and heard a bar tell a story That's that had That's retconning a history. That wasn't there 10 minutes ago. Right? It, it's it's a finer a detail that wasn't mentioned, but it's been well established that this guy spends time in bars drinking. There's right. no reason why he wouldn't have maybe heard a story at one point. Sometimes though, in a skill challenge, people are just forced to use skills that they're not proficient in. Exactly. You can't always you just can do use that something too. that you can... I mean, sometimes, yes, you have the option of what would you like to do to get out of this skill challenge. Sometimes, and let's just use a very simple example of what you just said, the floor falls out. Ah, sorry, Wiz, you, can't, you know, we're, do, we're doing acrobatics, so yeah. go for it. Um, okay, I know we've... Does anyone else have any final points before I come on to the last thing that I want us to cover? No. Which is, what is your best exploration that you've ever encountered? It can be within the game, out of the game, book, movie, your best that you draw inspiration from, but most memorable for you. Uh, okay. Are we rolling initiative on this? We can roll initiative Let's for this last one, sure. Yeah. I, these, I missed the dice box. And it's super dark. It's cocked. All right, Dan, you're up first. better. Um, I am constantly reminded of, I, I will actually pull a session of D&D and, um, doing, doing Chult and exploring Chult mm. at the time. What's was, Chult? Explain to the people that don't so, know. So, so in the, uh, the like Chult a, is like a, a salsa, ju- I think. <laughs> ah, no, it's a jungle island to the south in the, um, Forgotten Realms. It is where uh, Port Nianzaro is. It's where the entire Tomb of Annihilation module is kind of based out of. Um, look there. Part of Tomb Annihilation is this big, convoluted hex grid crawl. Um, I would highly recommend you modify the rules that they have at the table for it because the rules they have are garbage pants. Anyways, um, being able to make your way through the jungle and find different little um, ancient pieces of relic, ancient... Um, things, different encounters, uh, groups of people trying to find the same things you are or find other goals and do all that. It was so much fun once we wrote, rewrote the rules of how to do it. Um, so, so uh, what, really quickly, what did you rewrite? Like, why, why is this memorable when it was so bad before now it was good? So, this won't be quick. This won't be quick. <laughs> this won't be quick. No, uh, real, trying to make it brief. We made it so it was took less time rolling dice at the table to figure out where we went. Um, 
So it's Rather, about the pacing again. It, it's, it's about the pacing. We Rolling the time at the table, we did that for a few sessions, and it just became, okay, we were rolling for food, rolling for bug spray, and we are rolling to see if we get lost or not. And so every single person at the table did that three or four times in a row before anything you know unique or notable so came it's up. about pacing and variety it's about pacing and variety yeah. yeah okay but uh, that flavor of chult and all that really wanted me to pour into the fact that yeah you can have a very rich unexplored wild jungle and have your players just go have fun right yeah that, i really like it it would be a lot of fun yeah i would actually i've never i've never visited chult but i would like to yeah or something in the same like yeah. a desert have a bunch of giants, uh, giants wander a desert for a while. Who, Adam, you're next. Um, I, okay, I'm gonna toot my own horn on this one and say uh, <laughs> no. Not, not in front of me, you won't. <laughs> not after last time. Stay seated. Uh, you, you guys should remember when we played Death House upside down. Um, kind mm-hmm. of been memorable. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yep. so what happened was I don't know if you know this, Terry, but. Um, we ended up, uh, there was a sunken pirate ship in a ghostly uh, demiplane that you guys ended up exploring. You got onto this, onto this pirate ship mm-hmm. that was half sunk in the swamp, and you worked your way down. That was the death house module. That was two that, feet behind me yeah. on my bookshelf. Yeah. I and I flipped it upside down and reflavored it. Okay. Um, and ramped up the difficulty level to level, I think it was 11 at that point. Yeah. Um, because it's supposed to be an entry level. It is, yeah. But... Uh, I really wanted to explore the idea of Death House, and I was busy pitching it to another DM for her campaign. And I'm like, hey, have you thought about this? Look into this. And so I was reading through it, and I went, this is going to be a lot of fun. We've got this this haunted ship to do. I'm going to do the exact same thing, but I'm going to take out the children, and I'm going to put in a Captain Pirate and his wife, and I'm going to take uh, take out the attic, and I'm going to turn it into a... a uh, Catacomb system underneath the boat? Well, it, no, it wasn't even that. It was the holding bay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? So mm-hmm. um, the catacomb stuff I added on afterwards. Uh, but the entire death house that we did was upside down because I wanted you to come in at the at the first floor again and then work your way down instead of working your way up yeah. death house. But I watched you guys tiptoe your way through creepy shit consistently for the entire, like, three sessions that yeah, we spent. Yeah, it was a while. Yeah, yeah. In there. a while, yeah. And every little thing that you touched, every detail, because I had the module in front of me, and I changed a lot of it, but because I had this springboard to work off of, for me, it was very easy to say, there's a chandelier in this room and there's cobwebs hanging from it. There are these picture frames, one of them is crooked. And you guys are like, oh my God, why is it crooked? I'm like, why is it crooked? Let's find out. <laughs> and what's behind it? Yeah, and so there was there was a lot of that stuff. Um, and I, I changed things as well, like that picture frame that you like, swung around and used as almost a viewfinder to see mm-hmm. how the world really was through it. Yeah. That's not in Death House, but I'm like, okay, that, that's a cool little thing that we can add to it. Yeah. Um, but I focused so much on exploration, and until you got to the bottom level, I think there were four combats. In that there wasn't a whole thing. lot. Yeah, there wasn't a whole it lot. It was mostly exploring and tinkering and playing with stuff. And you guys were holding your breath yeah. all the way through it. And then it got really dark and creepy, and there was the fetus, and the, like, there was just... There was a lot of nasty it stuff got in there. Real dark. I remember yeah. saying to you after the session, like, you kind of took some risks with. I, the, I really the, did. The we're, we're subject gonna, matter. We're gonna have a rated R episode where I talk about <laughs> risks as a DM. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, that'd be a great episode. Okay, uh, what's yours? Me, mine is not D and D related, but I, I I really draw inspiration Get from this. Get off the podcast. <laughs> um, is from. And I read the book when I was very young. I haven't seen the new movie, but the old 1978 version of Watership Down. Oh, you yeah. guys ever seen yeah. this? Yeah. About the rabbits? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But for exploration-wise, to sink down into their world. For those of you guys at home, I won't spoil it for you, but you should. Half of the listeners just got a PTSD flashback. You, because you for those it. of you who've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You see the world from their point of view. Everything is bigger. Everything is more exaggerated. It is more traumatic. And things that you don't think about, such as... What happens in a network of rabbit tunnels when they can't get out? Everybody yeah. knows what I'm talking about now. Yeah. Becomes horrific. And it the, just makes you... It was it, the group hug? Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, and it just makes you... Because the D&D worlds are more exaggerated, right? So it just makes you look at things a little bit differently. And when the amount of trauma and, and touching on subjects such as madness, as well as religion, yeah. as well... It was just great, I thought. And it just really inspired me it, for... It, the thing that I love about that, too, is because everything that you're dealing with in that is... It has an environmental aspect yes. to it. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic for exploring 
how the environment, how the world around you shapes the encounters that the characters are going through. Right, because there was a lot of uh, politics and uh, even like military type stuff or religious yeah. things on that. And it yeah. was just, it was, it was traumatizing, but uh, it just made, really made me look at things differently. Yeah, it was great. So yeah. that's mine. Uh, I think that takes us to the end of everything we're going to talk about, unless anyone has any last minute tips or last minute things they want to throw in for exploration. No, we're good. Before we, can you? There it is. It's coming in now. It's getting louder. Thank you for listening to It's a Mimic. Check us out online at itsamimic.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Have questions you would like answered by the guys on the show? Send them an email to itsamimic at gmail.com. Tune in every Tuesday for more. That was it. There, right there. It's getting hotter. It's getting hotter. Hmm.